Hey everybody, what's going on? Paul from Hashtag Sports. So, lots of talk about all the craziness that has come down with Ed Oliver, and there's a couple things about that that you may not know, and a couple things that had happened in the league previously that you'll be very aware of as a Bills fan. So, let's talk about what is going on with Ed Oliver and kind of the finer details uh, that's happening at one Bills drive because of it. All right, so breaking down sort of the uh, the number crunching behind the uh, the Ed Oliver situation, we're going to go over to OverTheCap.com, uh, and with OverTheCap.com, we're pulling up the Buffalo Bills, and the reason we're doing that is because the Ed Oliver situation has created sort of a, a stir as far as the contracts go. Uh, now, under the collective bargaining agreement, rookies are basically given guaranteed contracts, especially those first-round players. There's guarantees within that. They get a pretty good signing bonus, and then a lot of the times their salaries are guaranteed afterwards. Um, it's not always a massive amount, but uh, a lot of times they can get some pretty nice guarantees. So let's take a look at Ed Oliver's contract. Uh, now, mind you, he is entering his second year. So let's see where he is here. And again, we're just looking at total cap hit. And there's Ed Oliver right here. Okay, so Ed Oliver is set to count $4.4 million against the salary cap this season. Now you'll notice that the 1.389, uh, that is in italics. If you're on uh, overthecap.com, what that means is that's guaranteed money. Okay, his base salary is guaranteed. Uh, not only that, but he also got just a massive signing bonus. So let's open up his individual contract status and we'll take a look at what is really there. Um, big difference between a top 10 pick and 11 through 32 pick. And as you all will remember, Ed Oliver was picked ninth overall. So if we had to take a look at what his fifth year option is right now, that money would be pretty steep. And actually here is the fully guaranteed money for Ed Oliver. Now you'll notice his contract is completely guaranteed. Okay. That means every base salary dollar is guaranteed. They promise to pay it to him. His signing bonus is already counted. That's guaranteed money as well. So let's roll back a little bit, Paul. Why are we talking about money? We don't always love it when you talk salary cap. So we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go to 2018. Um, and some of you may remember the fight on the sideline between Shaq Lawson and Leonard Fournette. Now, the reason we're talking about that fight is pretty easy. That fight between Leonard Fournette and Shaq Lawson, not only was it awesome, it was really expensive. Leonard Fournette actually had his fully guaranteed contract because he was a first round player as well. The salary was fully guaranteed. His fully guaranteed rookie contract, they eliminated all the guaranteed language. By getting into that fight and being suspended, he voided all the guaranteed money on his contract. So if the Jaguars wanted to cut him, they could, and it would only cost them what it cost them against their signing bonus, right? So whatever money was paid to him in a signing bonus that's prorated across every year. So what does this mean for Ed Oliver? Well, you've guessed it. Ed Oliver, if he's suspended, will void the money in his contract. So um, we've kind of seen this play out over the course of, you know, other examples. Obviously, Leonard Fournette was suspended one game for fighting. Chris Herndon was suspended from the NFL for four games for a very similar reason as Ed Oliver. Uh, and that was last season. Actually, when the Bills played the Jets, Herndon was still suspended. Um, but Herndon's suspension, again, similar thing, right? Suspensions can void guarantees in rookie deals. But what it does do is it takes away the financial stability of Ed Oliver in future years. So if the Bills want to trade him now, well, it's not hard to trade Ed Oliver. If they want to cut him, it's not hard to cut Ed Oliver from a financial standpoint. Whereas before, you had to fully guarantee the money in his deal. Uh, they're going to likely submit to have that voided, which means that the future money in his contract will not be promised. Now, ethical thing. Let's, let's talk about ethics right now, right? A lot of people say this is a young man making a young man's mistake. And I understand that, although I will never, ever, ever condone a DWI driving while intoxicated, you can never condone that activity. However, I do want to point out that there is an exceptional amount of stress put on a player from the college life 
immediately being thrust into the draft, and then that first offseason, that's the first real break they get in like 18 months, right? So it's a big, long process. So do I understand that players want to blow off steam and won't make the best decisions because they're likely on lockdown during the season? Yeah, absolutely. I understand and respect that that's a possibility. And if your player is going to make a bad decision, a young player is probably going to make it in their first official offseason, so after their rookie season. And that appears to be what this is. It's a, it's, a, it's a really bad look. It's a bad decision and also a very expensive decision. So going back to the contract, we're going to look at it again. The $2.2 million that he has guaranteed for next season... If the Bills want to move on from Ed Oliver, they could cut him. It would cost them um, about $6 million to do so in 2021. If they decide they want to cut or trade him in 2022, it would cost them $3 million. So whereas the Bills would have had to absorb this money, the, this base salary against their salary cap, uh, in order to uh, move on from Ed Oliver in a variety of ways, they don't have to do that anymore. Now, with that being said, Leonard Fournette did file a grievance against the NFL regarding voiding his base salary. And as much as I've scoured the internet, I cannot find the results of that grievance. Uh, I know that he uh, was also fined and he fought that uh, fine internally with the NFL and won that arbitration hearing. But as far as him vo getting uh, the contract language of guaranteed money voided, um, I haven't seen. I haven't been able to dig up anything to say that the NFL accepted or denied or through arbitration, um, you know, did anything with this case. Now again, this does not mean anything if your intention is to keep Ed Oliver on your team, right? The voiding guaranteed money actually impacts nothing in that instance, right? If you intend on keeping Ed Oliver and keeping him through his fifth year option, then voiding the guarantees in his contract is really no big deal. Right. Uh, if you're intending on keeping him and he's going to show up to work every day, then, um, you know, you could. Yeah. You, you, if you void that base salary guarantee, it doesn't cost him any more money. But what it does do is remove the guarantee that he's going to get paid regardless of what he does. So that's what collective bargaining agreements are really out there for is to try and protect organizations and players from making decisions that are uh, detrimental to themselves and other people. Um, this actually makes a bit of sense. So I can't really be mad if the Buffalo Bills do void uh, Ed Oliver's uh, guaranteed money. But again, from an ethical standpoint, if they're going to keep Ed Oliver regardless, voiding the base salary doesn't really have that much of an impact on it. Now okay, quick edit. Joe from Believer's Talk down in the comments section, who is uh, one of the members of Hashtag Nation. Again, thanks, Joe, for clicking that join button. Um, brought up a really great point, and it's about the new CBA and that Goodell is not the judge, jury, and executioner. So let's, again, kind of repack a little bit of this conversation. Okay, here's the deal. What's going to end up happening is Roger Goodell is not judge, jury, and executioner before he used to handle all individual appeals um, and he used to also dole out initial punishment. Now with the new CBA, a arbitrator is brought in to make those decisions. So Goodell is not the first line of defense. He's not judge, jury, and executioner any longer. There's actually an arbitrator that comes in and makes suspension-based decisions or fine-based decisions whenever discipline comes down through the league. This is a good thing for players. A lot of players thought Goodell was uh, pretty cutthroat and pretty ruthless and, and you know, you know, harbored a lot of resentment towards him. So this kind of removes him from that process. But that's this is twofold, okay? First off, the CBA lowered its substance abuse first uh, strike, right? Which at Oliver would be, it'd be a first strike for him. Lowered it from a three-game suspension to a two-game suspension. Now, you're gonna hear me talk about a player uh, getting a four-game suspension, right? Uh, here's the deal, right? Um, that was a three-game suspension plus because um, it wasn't just a substance abuse penalty. They tacked on an additional game for issues that happened within the events uh, that rolled down. So Herndon, it was a, a DWI hit and run, right? Um, so that was kind of the deal there. Um, so long story short, what you're looking at now is a two-game suspension for Ed Oliver from the league through the substance abuse policy. And then, I'm, again, I'm just assuming that uh, if the league does see him, as being intoxicated while driving, which they have to make that determination, whether charges are brought against him or not are irrelevant. The league is going to dole out punishment based on 
its process, right? Although there could be a leg to stand on for Oliver to say, I wasn't charged with anything and that's the way that it ultimately goes. But um, there's add-ons to that, right? So uh, he could get a two game suspension for that plus one for the gun that he had, which was illegal in Texas because he was intoxicated. It's not like he was carrying an unregistered weapon. You just can't be in possession of a firearm while you are intoxicated, it's sort of an add-on. Um, and he could see an additional game for that. Um, but right now, the way CBA structures it, there's an arbitrator that handles all appeal-based services, and then it's a two-game suspension for a first strike substance abuse uh, suspension. And then, again, there could be additional disciplinary add-ons, which is why I'm talking about four games. The reason that I bring that up is because we have no precedent here, right? The only precedent that's been set is what Roger Goodell was doling out personally. So that's where we have to start, even though there's an arbitrator that's been brought in. And even though the suspension in the CBA has been lowered from three games down to two, um, we still only have the precedent of what was done previously. Arbitrator or not, we can only work off the info that we have so far. So while the process has changed, we're going to kind of go by the assumption uh, at this point that the precedent is going to set future action. Um, and this is an opportunity for the NFL to kind of reset that suspension protocol, which could be pretty steep at times. Um, will they do it uh, with Ed Oliver? Who knows? Uh, but I wanted to make that point. It was, a, it was a great point by Joe. So I wanted to bring it in and edit that in. I also saw Clayton Garrett mention the same or mention something uh, uh, as well from the cold front report. And Clayton uh, was the one that mentioned the CBA lowered from a three game to a two game suspension that was offline. Uh, so great points there. Um, so I just want to kind of revisit that and drop this note in for you guys. Now, if we take a look at what happens if Ed Oliver suspended the first four games, well, that's a different conversation. Because, again, if we look at Chris Herndon, which was just last year, it looks like a four-game suspension, right? And and through an appeal process, if they, if they deal out a suspension sooner rather than later, then, you know... Uh, we might see it the first four games this year, uh, which is what I would kind of anticipate is the first four games this year. Um, although it could be very well delayed and he could be suspended from the NFL at any time. But let's just kind of, for argument's sake, say that it's the first four games this season. Let's pull up the depth chart. Let's pull up the opponents and let's kind of take a look at it. All right, so we'll start with the depth chart. We're just on ESPN.com. Uh, so if we take a look at the defensive tackle depth chart right now, and again, this is unofficial. The Buffalo Bills have not released an official depth chart. Rosters are at 90, so there's a lot of play here. But if we're taking a look across the board, right, Star Latule is still listed as your start as a starting defensive tackle, and then Ed Oliver is the other. So again, let's eliminate Ed Oliver for the first four games. So what that means is it's kind of a, a battle to the death between Vernon Butler, Harrison Phillips, Vincent Taylor, and Quentin Jefferson. Um, obviously, you kind of expect Harrison Phillips to uh, pick it up early on. McDermott is a big fan of incumbents, and just as long as Harrison Phillips comes back healthy, the opportunity for him to start is likely there. But we know the Bills love to run uh, rotations on the interior. So uh, you're figuring that likely, you know, you're probably looking at Oliver's going to drop out of 50% of the defensive snaps. I think that's a little optimistic the first four games, but likely 50%. So if Oliver does... Uh, gets suspended the first four games, you're looking at likely Harrison Phillips takes over the starting role and then just a rotation between probably Vernon Butler and Quentin Jefferson, if I had to guess right now. Now, again, you're not looking at a massive issue there. It's the beginning of the season, uh, but the Bills have often, uh, the last couple of years, had a pretty deep defensive tackle uh, depth chart, and they've been able to get some great finds. You know, Jordan Phillips was one of them. Um, and you know what, honestly, uh, if Ed Oliver does end up being suspended, uh, what that does do is it frees up the opportunity for the Bills to bring back Corey Legit, who they had signed last season. Um, so again, if you're looking for a way to kind of fill that hole that's missing, you do have Harrison Phillips coming back, so do not forget about him. Again, incumbents are a big thing with McDermott. He likely steps into a starting role, minus Oliver. And then from a depth standpoint, if you're uncomfortable with uh, Vernon Butler or uh, Vincent Taylor um, or Quentin Jefferson, uh, Corey Legit's still out there. He remains unsigned, and that remains an option for you as well. Now, looking at the schedule, how impactful is this really going to be? Well, anytime you see two division games lost to a suspension from a former first round player, um, you get frustrated, 
right? Especially the top 10 pick. Uh, here we go. We're going to miss the Jets game. We're going to miss the Miami game. But it's the Jets and it's Miami and early season. So I'm really comfortable with missing Oliver for those two games. Uh, the Jets, you know, offensive line is is a tire fire. Um, they're from a wide receiver standpoint. Uh, I'm not really threatened by them. So I think it, it is going to be a lot on the defensive tackle rotation to keep Le'Veon Bell in check. Um, but even so, I, I'm not really missing at Oliver that much. Uh, things early in the season uh, have a tendency to be a little hot and cold. Uh, again, I don't expect a lot of passing in that game from Darnold unless the Jets fall really behind. Uh, you would kind of expect a heavy dose of run in week one. Um, but from a defensive line standpoint, I'm pretty comfortable walking into week one if Ed Oliver were to be suspended against the Jets. Now, Miami has tried to completely revamp their offense and completely revamp their defense. They're trying to turn over the roster as best they can. They've drafted a bunch of players. People were all over whether they loved or hated the Dolphins draft, but the fact still remains that team is loaded with rookies, and there is nothing tastier than a team who just went through a massive draft overhaul and expecting to play those players. So again, I'm comfortable with Oliver being out for the Jets and Miami. Now that leads us to the Rams game. Um, now, truth be told, the Rams are hemorrhaging money. Um, they're in bad, bad, bad shape. So as far as investments go, they haven't really been able to make great investments in their team. They've kind of been shaving a lot of stuff. Uh, where they were, you know, a high-powered, quick-hitting offense. Uh, there's those pieces of that puzzle are starting to fall apart. And Jared Goff looked really exposed last season. Um, and that defense that was so stalwart is losing the people that make that defense so challenging. So um, while I would normally say the Rams, uh-oh, uh, the Rams had just an awful off-season. And again, I'm, I can't say that I'm super concerned. Um, super concerned about um, the Rams rushing attack. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable uh, with Ed Oliver being out against Jared Goff. He, he looked pretty pedestrian last season. And um, again, from a depth standpoint, I think I'm okay with this one. The final one is the away game in Las Vegas. Probably a good thing that he won't be making the trip. Um, Vegas can make you crazy. Vegas will make you do some crazy things. So I can't even imagine the stories that are come on, going to come out from other NFL teams about what their players did in Vegas. They're going to have to hire them all babysitters because of how irresponsible I'm sure a majority of them will be. I'm also really curious when teams will travel to Vegas. That's an interesting conversation. Normally teams will travel the day before, do walkthroughs, um, or sometimes two days before, depending on time zone. Um, sometimes three days before, again, depending on time zone and facility usage. So uh, very curious when teams are going to be traveling to Vegas. But um, again, you're looking at the Raiders who were pretty bad last season. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big John Gruden fan. I've never thought his offense was, was anything spectacular. And that team doesn't really appear to be going anywhere. So uh, again, if I'm looking at impactful games... Uh, I think the Rams game will probably be the hardest out of the four, but even then, I can find reasons not to be worried about this. Um, just as long as I get him back for Kansas City, just as long as I get him back for Tennessee, just as long as I get him back for the Patriots, like if if there were two matches of those, if those two games were inserted into you know the first four, if it went the Jets, the Titans, Kansas City, and the Raiders, I'd be like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes a little bit. We got a problem on our hands. But you're missing the Jets, you're missing the Dolphins, you're missing the, the Rams, um, and you're missing the, the Raiders. And if I had to pick four teams to miss, those are kind of the four I'd probably end up with. Uh, you take a look, I, I would hate for him to miss Seattle, San Francisco, and maybe the Chargers. Probably, the, maybe I'd pick the Chargers. Maybe I'd pick the Broncos. But outside of that, I, I'm happy with the first four games that he's missing. If this is what it's going to come to, really, how bad is it going to be? Um, now, again, we've had some examples recently of what's going to happen from a suspension standpoint. And from a suspension standpoint, it's likely going to be four games. From a contract standpoint, the contract's likely going to get voided from the guaranteed money. But that's only as big a deal as he makes it. If he wants to grieve that, he is welcome to do so. I, as I said, I, I believe Leonard Fournette is still doing the same thing because that fight cost him all the guaranteed money in his contract. Uh, at one bill's drive. 
So it's kind of interesting how that all plays out, but um, this isn't a big deal. Um, from, from a schedule standpoint, this isn't a big deal from a depth perspective. Um, and it's kind of a testament to how strong a team really is. If you have faith in the organization, then you'll have faith that they're going to make it through this. And I got to be honest with you, the sides are there to say the Bills are going to survive this one just fine. So my name is Paul. Thank you for chilling with me at Hashtag Sports. Make sure you give a like and hit that subscribe and hit that notification bell if you have it. And then if you want to contribute to the channel, hit that join button. We've got many different levels of membership. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys soon. Have a great one and uh, enjoy a beautiful sunny week in Buffalo, New York, if, uh, if you manage to be local. If you're somewhere else, the weather's probably a lot better. It's just the way it is, man. We're hardy folk up here. All right, guys, have a good one. I'll talk to you.